mine had only one objective for her, get married to a rich man. And she uh, nevertheless created something no one had ever heard of, uh, Hull House in Chicago. And she, she changed the world in that way. And she, she did all sorts of things, but did it with her own style and her own way. And I thought, well, my goodness, if she could do that, perhaps I could do something of importance. And then the question was, what? Um, I came to New York because uh, I married a New Yorker, and we stayed in New York. And uh, I was um, beginning to organize something called the National Women's Agenda, which was an ad a 10-point agenda which answered the question, what do women want? And I had managed to organize the leaders of almost 100 national women's organizations to embrace this agenda. And it was an extraordinarily diverse group. It was the National Council of Negro Women, of Puerto Rican Women, of Mexican Women, the Lesbian Caucus of the National Gay Task Force, the Household Workers, Union Women, just went on and on, and even the National Conference of Women Religious, the nuns' orders. And I got them to agree to sign on to this agenda, which uh, has all of the points you might imagine about childcare and right to one's own bodies and on and on. And we were going to take the next step and present it to Congress, and I couldn't get these people to move. After we'd had all these meetings, they'd hammered out the language. And I began to think my problem was an historical problem. And I called Sarah Lawrence College, where a woman named Gerda Lerner had founded the first women's history program in the United States. I explained that I was an activist and thinking that I had a historical problem. And I wondered if she would have a consulta consultation with me. Big pause. And she finally said, you know, no, one, no activist has ever called me to have a historical consultation, but come on out. So I went on the train to Sarah Lawrence in Bronxville, and I essentially sat at her feet for an entire day as she gave me a personal lecture on the history of women's organizing efforts. And I learned from that that all of the successful efforts by women, national ones, had been organized from the bottom up. And I had gone to the presidents first, so we switched the whole program and went back into the states, got the states to go and tell, get the, pass it, take, take it to the president so the presidents could be sure that when they led, someone would follow. And that, uh, that was a big lesson for me because it showed me that history had the capacity to offer a strategy for a present day problem. Just as Jane Addams had shown me that history could offer a role model when there is none exactly that you need in your own life. Um, and then I was asked to speak by the Kettering Foundation to school superintendents. This is in the 1970s. And at the time, the superintendents were arranged in four regions of the country and they flew a faculty in to give talks. They wanted to introduce the superintendents to the wider world. The person who invited me told me that in all the years, I was the first woman to be invited. And he said that 90% of the school superintendents were white male former football coaches. So I gave a gentle title to my remarks, Women in America, and I went to my first city. And when I got up to speak, a man threw a, his notes, his book over my notes so I couldn't see. And then he put a ringing alarm clock in my ear after five minutes. And the whole place went, hey, it was great, wonderful. And it was, sort of went downhill from there, though I kept trying. And I left there and went, got on the plane for the next city. And in the next city, 
these guys got up out of their seats and screamed, your husband let you run around like that? And then they threw spitballs at me. And then I got on the next one, and this time I got to the place, and the man met me at the door with a whole group of people, and he said, we're, we're going out, but you're not going with us. And I said, why am I not going with you? And he said, well, we're going dancing, and we all know feminists don't dance. <laughs> so I'm on the plane, I, and I, know I forgot to tell you one thing, that that night, I was wakened by a man standing over my bed in the dorm of the women's dorm, and he said, I just wanted to see how a feminist slept. Oh. Off he went. I was exhausted. I had been afraid. I had been without any supporters there. Not, nobody from the Kettering Foundation came to my defense. And I got on the plane, and I began to weep. And I reached into my bag, and there was a book by this same Gerda Lerner about the Grimsky sisters of South Carolina who'd been white women, fierce abolitionists. And, and I read that when they were speaking, their building had been burned right there as they spoke. And I said to myself, no one's burned my building. I can go on. And there again, history gave me courage. And I began to think, what a gift. What a gift could I give this gift to other people? Could I find a way to use history that would give people role models, courage, a perspective, a point of view, a strategy? And I began to think, what it, was it that I wanted to say? And I wanted to say something that also came from my background. When I was a little girl, I was 13 years old, and all of the friends I'd grown up with in this little school we're going to a bigger high school. And when I got to the high school with my poodle skirt and my Peter Pan collar and my circle pin and my saddle shoes, I felt I was ready. And then all these girls I'd grown up with, my friends gathered around me and said that you, you can't come to our parties anymore. You can't come to what they, cotillion, which was a big deal. You see, you're Jewish. It's not us, it's our parents. And I was thrown out of the world I had been so part of. And what it made me feel is, I never want to do that to anybody else. I never want anybody to do that to anybody else. And these two streams, what history could do and the horrible sting of, of prejudice led me to think, let's, let's see if I could talk about the stranger in the land. Let's see if I could find a way to bring people home so that these strangers become people they know. And that led me to the thought of a tenement museum. Now, mind you, I had no museum experience, which meant I didn't know I was breaking the rules. And that helped a great deal. Yeah. <laughs> I just knew what I wanted to try to say and that I wanted to do it in a colloquial, warm, and emotionally charged way and in a truthful way. So the idea of immigrants really interested me and I thought, well, where could that story be told? And I thought about the fact that the Lower East Side has for, forever been associated with immigrants. Now at first, because, like everybody else I knew, I thought this would be Jewish immigrants, but different kinds. But it turned out as we got into the story that it was all sorts of immigrants, and that was so, so exciting. And as we got into the research uh, of the stories, uh, we began to create, and we, I'm saying, we've got, we is, with some of the we's are here, there's Steve Long, there's Catherine Snyder, who else is here? Yeah, there's David Favarello, and uh, yeah, who else? <laughs> and we was they. So we were looking for a way to fashion these stories. They, they researched, uh, we had Marsha Dennis, uh, who was a genealogist researching, and they found, the thir they found there were probably 1,300 people. She found 1,300 herself and thought there were 7,000. 
And then we called them and figured out who was going to be, uh, who was going to show the variety of experiences, who's got a story to tell, an interesting, dramatic one, because we wanted tears. <laughs> who, who's got, who's got um, a story that could raise contemporary issues? And that's how we began to build the Tenement Museum. Now, um, I, I didn't do this by myself. I've just named four people. Over time, there were so many people who came to help us and came involved in the museum. Now, I didn't find 97 Orchard Street. We had given up. Anita Jacobson and I, she worked as a volunteer at the, uh, at the synagogue, at the Eldridge Street Synagogue, and I found her there and robbed them <laughs> of her. Yeah. And uh, she, she was looking everywhere for us for a tenement for two years. And uh, we had to find one that was old enough so it was, so it was, you could see the fabric of a really uh, old law tenement before the laws were passed. And we had to be able to back out so onto a, a clearing so that we would meet the, the requirements for ac 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 access, yeah. And uh, one day she called me, she, but we'd given up. We were just going to now look for a storefront because we had to begin this thing or we were going to just end it. So we found, she found the storefront. She called me and said, I think I've found our museum. I came over right away and she had, she had saw the, she'd seen the storefront in the basement unheated. She said, that'll be fine. She said, but where are the toilets? And the landlord took her upstairs and showed her the hallway toilets. And Anita, who'd been looking at so many pictures of these old law tenements, said, oh my goodness, we're not going to be a shoe store here. Yeah. We're going to be a tenement museum. And the owner said, well, you've come home. Oh. So that was a great statement. And we, we came home for five years in the basement. We had. Uh, uh, the, before there were the, the you know, the, the gloves you could buy where you could have your fingers out, we had them on because we had to type with them. It was so cold. And uh, often Anita had to shove, shovel, I don't know how, I, I think I must have let her go first, shovel uh, human waste from the stairs. And I mean, it was yucky and it was people would say, why are you building it there? I mean, my goodness, it's such a crime-ridden, drug-infested, filthy area. Well, we were building it there because that's where the tenements were and that's where this story would begin. So does that give you a beginning sense? Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> right. Ruth and I were chatting backstage and we established one important fact that two-thirds of the presidents of the Tenement Museum have come from the South. And Southerners know how to tell a story, don't you think? <laughs> now, there had to have been doubters in the early days who were saying some of the things that you just said to you. How did you answer them? Well, there were, there were some expected doubters and then there were some unexpected doubters. Um, one uh, man who I thought, Anita and I gave tours of the tenement when there was nothing there but the ruin. That was illegal, but what can you do? That's what we had. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> the tours that we gave were of potential donors and people who might, we might be able to rope in. And one donor, very, very rich, uh, I took him through and told him sort of stories that we had learned about the, muse, the, the building and maybe the people who lived there, we weren't sure. And he turned to me and said, you know, this is a big job for a little girl. Oh. Made me all the more determined. <laughs> when we got going, foundations were very confused because we said that we were going to do things like teach English to immigrants because we felt that the story would inspire them and that they would want to tell their own stories and we could draw the connections. They said, that's the job of a settlement house. I said, I didn't think so. I thought it was the job of a, of a tenement museum. Um, the preservation community at first turned their backs. I have a formal letter from a leader in it saying, tenements are of no redeeming architectural value. No one of importance lived there, and anyway, there are thousands of them. 
And my answer was, that's right. That's what we want. They came around. Now the woman who wrote the letter hopes I burn it, burned it. Um, the, I went to see Irving Howe. I don't know if you know who Irving Howe was. He wrote A World of Our Fathers, very famous scholar of the Yiddish Jewish experience on the Lower East Side, and, I, and a socialist, and I thought for sure he would be supportive. So we met in Katz Delicatessen, and he said, I won't support it, not a bit. Why? You're going to glorify poverty. I said, I don't think we will. I don't intend to, and I don't think we will. He said, you can't help it, no. Well, that was a blow. Um, then we had the two political, because the idea was that we would take issues that are current today and link them to what we knew about the immigrants in our tenement and the lives that they lived. Well, you're going to walk a very fine line, and it's going to get right into this business of politics. Right. <laughs> we're going to walk a very fine line, and we're going to tell the stories, and we're going to show how they relate or don't relate to the contemporary issues. I have no apology for that. Uh, a surprising uh, group that opposed us were the, um, the, the institution of the Orthodox Jews controlled by Sheldon Silver, who's now waiting to go to jail. <laughs> Happens. <laughs> <laughs> They wrote me a letter saying that until I told the only important story of the Lower East Side, they were not going to support me. Now, obviously, the only important story in his mind was the story of Jews. Uh, it wasn't the only important story, and it wasn't the only story, and that's what I couldn't get through their heads. Uh, they never relented. Um, so those were some of the and foundations Foundations were confused because it looked like a settlement. It looked like it teetered on the edge of politics. It looked impossible. Why would anybody go down there? Nobody goes down there. So that took a long time to raise the money. It took five years to convince the landlord to sell us the building, and then took a long time more to raise the money to restore the building. So we were on the Lower East Side mostly doing research once we had um, found that we could buy the building, doing a little, any little money we got so that we put it into research. So it was about five years of research with little to show for it. But I was of the opinion, and I think it's true, that excellent research is part of what made this such an important museum. There's, we don't tell stories we don't know about, and we don't tell them without context. So that was important to me. I think it's been important to the museum. Were there ever moments when you thought yourself, oh my god, what am I doing? I, I give up. Well, when I left the museum, or say stood down from the presidency, uh, Renee Epps, who was the vice president, also very important name in the founding of the museum, hand embroidered a pillow with something I kept telling the staff, telling myself, even more, which is no is only for now. And that is what I found out. I just, I couldn't take no for an answer usually. So I didn't believe in no. And so, no, the answer is no. <laughs> Was there, on the other side, was there a moment when you realized we did it, we succeeded, we achieved what I wanted to achieve? Yes. When we started the first tours and people wept, <laughs> I, I felt I'd had it. When we started the first tours and staff was so excited about it. When we started the tours and because we had no money really to spend on hiring wonderful guides, we became the guides, all of us, and we all did it and we all became part of the education process at the museum and we all knew our visitors and we all saw them cry and laugh and tell their stories and it was at that kind of point that I knew 
that this was going to work because we had a dedicated and informed staff, we had a, a cohesive staff, we had a story to tell that many people were interested in, and I felt that we were on our way. It was still very small. Now, you spoke a lot about this when you told your opening story, but I want to kind of revisit this question. What was your main motivation? What did you hope you would achieve by creating the museum? Well, I hope to eliminate prejudice in America. <laughs> <laughs> I think that deserves a round of applause. I hope to create empathy for people who are strangers in the land. I hope to uh, create a climate of conversation about this issue uh, based on what we know about immigrants past and what we know and are finding out about immigrants present. I hoped that Americans would come in and see that their families, who they were so proud of in their own stories, would uh, understand that the person on the street who was speaking now another language or uh, looking uh, ill-dressed or, or didn't know the customs of our country was standing in the same shoes as their great-grandparents had been standing in. They were reviled at that time. And, that, and to see that they loved them, that they appreciated them, that they understood that they created their first foothold in America, they paved the way for their success, and that that would be that. But it wasn't, because early on, we began to hear people say, go through the museum and say, wah, but those were the good immigrants. They came, left everything behind, they worked hard, they learned the language, they uh, didn't want welfare, they helped each other, but today those people are just coming for the money and the welfare and and they don't want to learn the language, and they don't want to be Americans, and we just, they should just go back. This was the most disappointing thing I had heard. Now, I told you I wasn't going to say no, but it was a horrible thing to hear. And uh, then the staff began to develop ideas about how we could bring uh, the tourists into conversation earlier, and they restructured the tours to raise questions earlier, and they developed kitchen conversations which uh, help people come together and discuss uh, immigration past and present. And I sat in on quite a number of those discussions, and I felt they were extraordinarily illuminating. It's a big struggle to make this connection. It's a big struggle, but I think it's so worth it because, because we have this touchstone in ourselves of dislocation, relocation, and reinvention, all of us. And that's the point that we can begin to push and, and move and, and gently massage. Um, what was the most surprising thing you found in the museum, in the actual building? You go into this 150-year-old building that's been abandoned for 50 years. There's a lot of stuff. Tell us a story about something you found which was fascinating to you. Well, the first thing, uh, it, it knocked us off our preconceived notion. The first thing was we found uh, golden, gold leaf chair railings. This is not supposed to be what Jacob Reese's immigrants lived in, <laughs> and, uh, and yet they were there. And we found beautiful stenciling in the ceiling. And it's obvious that the pe some people who lived here had gone to a lot of trouble to decorate and had done it very tastefully. So that, that was interesting. And then to discover that the landlord, their first landlord, felt it was such a fine building that he was proud to move in himself with his family and other relatives. Um, so that, that was upsetting to some of the preservationists who felt that we were going to go off and say that uh, not, when they felt their investment in the idea that very poor people were the only people who'd lived in tenements and from the beginning. But that turns out not to have been true. And we, we had to call the story like it is, just, just the way it is. You have to tell what you find. 
Um, we made mistakes. Uh, the wallpaper in the um, <laughs> gum prints apartment has <laughs> been changed. And, uh, you know, it's okay to make mistakes as long as you tell everybody it's a mistake. That's the process of history. We, we, we'll do as best we can to get it right, but when we make a mistake, we have to turn around and explain it and how we did it so that they can understand the process of history. And I think that's a very important part and part of what we ought to be doing. And to show people that there's no, well, one person who left uh, the employee of the Tenement Museum, a very nice guy, but he wanted to move to the South. I asked him what he'd learned from me, because he was very thankful, blah, blah, blah. He said, what did you actually learn? He said, well, I learned that you don't have to know everything. I said, that's right. <laughs> I certainly didn't. Um, so what, what else was surprising? Let's see. There was something else that I wanted to tell you about that was a real surprise. Oh, it was a surprise um, to me that um, that um, there were so many nations involved, 20 that we found. I love that. That was just so incredible. And I was surprised by what came out uh, in our conversations with the descendants. And I'll just tell you one story, which all of my old tenement friends know very well. We, had in, we, were, we were planning to create the apartment for the um, a bit showing Shiva. Who's that? <laughs> Pop quiz. <laughs> you know, my husband says that at dinner, instead of talking about, you know, current events, for, for 20 years we talked about the Rogashevskys, the Moors. <laughs> How are the Moors today? Well, they've just lost a baby, you know. So like <laughs> yeah. So, um, the, the, uh, the, the number of immigrants, how many nationalities, and I was so fascinated when we got to the story of the outdoor toilets and learned that when they came inside, it was many immigrants who didn't want them. They felt that they were dirty. Why would you put them inside your house? I thought that was a very fascinating uh, thing. And then I guess one of the great uh, exciting moments was when uh, a bevy of police officers showed up with crime photos. And these are were from the 1890s, and you all know that people who lived in tenements then wouldn't have spent money on having a photographer come to their apartment to take pictures of them. They went to the studio if they had an occasion. But here, was, here were the crime photos with, you know, this lady's head in the oven, this person's with a knife stuck in them. And they must have been so shocked, these police officers, when we gathered around and said, oh, look, there's a calendar on the wall. Look at those curtains. See how the furniture is. But that was a great, <laughs> that was a really great find. So those are some of the things. Well, tonight there are over 150 people here who either work at or have worked at the Tenement Museum. Um, if you could say anything, give us advice, give us insights, give us a bit of history for those of us who are carrying on your legacy, what would you like to tell us? Keep on keeping on. This is not going to get easier, especially right now, and you're going to hear the same thing we are used to hear too, and you have to keep finding ways to bring people into the conversation in a way that's respectful. And I would congratulate you and Kevin on a job well done. I see what's happening here, and it's just tremendous, makes me tremendously proud of what's happening at the Tenement Museum and of you. Thank you. You may have noticed that immigration's in the news. Um, I'm curious what you think the role of a museum is when the issue it addresses has become one of the most politicized and polarized in the country. I think it is to explain uh, what immigration has always been, but I think it's very important that we refrain from depending on saying, 
we were all immigrants, or we all have immigrants in our families, or we are immigrants, or we are migrants from whether willingly or no. I think the thing to say is, or to do, is to demonstrate in very clear forms, and, and you all will be very creative about this, what is it like to be, uh, to be a newcomer here in America now? What do you eat? How do you handle money? What do you do when the children speak English but you don't? What, do you, what, is, what happens when your family turns topsy-turvy, the authority which once rested with parents, now it rests with the child? What happens in the family when the children have to go to school and explain to the teacher what the bad things the teacher just said about him? What happens to, when you go to the doctor with your parent and have to answer the doctor's questions because, and they're all very personal and tell your parents you're having to tell them that? These are so many stresses. What about, what, what do you do with a budget? How do you handle having almost no money? How do you find housing? Those questions were answered here by real people, and you know those answers. And we could make that comparison very, very clear, and we could bring contemporary immigrants to the fore to tell those stories with the Baldizis and the Levines and the Rogashevskis and the new people who have added to the museum. And I think that might help in this uh, rabid situation. Um, but we have to try it, and that's the other thing I hope we will all remember, that we have to try things, and if they don't work, so what? We have to try. Otherwise, we won't know. And if it doesn't work this way, maybe it will work that way but it's very important to experiment. And this museum was built on, a, on, a, on an experiment. And there was no reason really to think it could work. And it did, and it does, and you do, and you do, and you can. That's what I say. Well, um, <laughs> I want to pick up on something you said earlier. Um, you said that there were people who were critical of you in your early days who said, oh, you're too political. Um, how did you answer that? I said we're not lobbying. We're not supporting this person or that person for Congress or Senate or President. That's political. We are talking about what happened here on the Lower East Side to immigrants, and we are, comp we are talking about it as things are happening to immigrants today. And so we are pointing out what happened then and what happened now. Now, you can draw your own conclusion as to what's going on here, but we're not forcing you to take a position. We are suggesting that the facts and how those come down here, and I don't think that's political. I think that's education. Um, yeah, thank you. One last question before we turn it over to the audience. Let's go 30 years into the future. It's the 60th anniversary of the Tenement Museum. What's your, you had this incredible dream 30 years ago, which like you said, should never have worked, and it did. What's your dream for 30 years from now? I hope for, I'll tell you my first concern. I, I feel that this uh, the blocks around the Tenement Museum need to be landmarked because otherwise the landscape that immigrants knew will be obliterated. There will be uh, all sorts of tall buildings. I mean, imagine this in the midst, this one little tenement in the midst of skyscrapers or raised properties. And I, I think that the uh, landscape is part of this story because it was all these tenements all these people living in such dense, uh, so densely together. And uh, I think that needs to be preserved for people to, to better understand it. So I hope that uh, there will be an effort to, to landmark it, the area, or just a few blocks even. Um, I like Kevin's idea of taking these messages out. I think it's very, uh, you know, it needs to be thought out very carefully, and I'm sure you all will. Uh, but how to take it out, because one of the 
things that is so important about the museum and so effective about it is that you're standing in the story. You're standing in the story. And you could take that message out in a book, you could take it out in a song, you could take it out in a play, but how do you take out standing in the story? So that's the challenge. But I think, it, you know, I think you all will come up with a solution and I think that you'll come up with many ideas before you hit on one that is just right. But I think it does uh, require, I, I think it is worth taking it out, so. Well, we're gonna open up to the floor for questions. Uh, please wait until uh, Chelsea comes to you with the microphone to start talking so we can be sure to hear you. Um, I'm a little bit blinded, but I will assume if you raise your hand and gesticulate wildly that I will uh, be able to see you. I see someone here in the middle. Hi, I'm Grace, big fan. Um, how, how is Anita? Nita's great. Good. We, we just had dinner recently, and um, we stayed in her apartment overnight. That was nice. And uh, she is, has become a very fine artist. She's showing in many galleries, and she's doing collage, and it's beautiful. So she's selling and showing and has gotten a new uh, career for herself. She's great. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kirk. Hi. Um, can you talk just a little bit about the experience of meeting Josephine Baldizi? <laughs> Josephine Baldizi was so overwhelmed with the idea that her family story was going to be turned into a museum exhibit. That was just shocking. And she worked tirelessly with us to show what her uh, apartment looked like and to tell us stories. And, and we, we loved every story. We, we treated it like the treasure it was. Uh, we had a renderer do a uh, rendering of the apartment as she described it. And actually, I have this rendering, and if the Tenement Museum wants it, just has to ask. <laughs> <laughs> but this rendering showed under, uh, near the stove, I think, darkness on the floor. And I showed it to Josephine and she said, please don't show that to anybody. And I thought she was worried about the crack in the, on the wall, which she had described under the cross. But no, she said, that people are gonna think that's dirt. And my mama was Im an impeccable cleaner. I said to her, whenever I showed it, and if I give it to you all, you have to do this, I explained that it's a shadow, not dirt. Uh, she, she, like everyone we met who had lived here, would never have wanted their children to live here at 97. It was cramped and it was hot and it was uh, it was loud and it was, it was, you know, sharing the toilets was a pain and you knew everybody's business and there were many things about it that were not good. But she said, and they all said, my children will never ever have the pleasure of real community. And I think that's a very important thing. And um, the, the, uh, when we look at immigrant communities today, they are recreating that that sense of community that we have so often lost in our suburban or high rises or whatever. So I think we have something to learn from them and that's another thing that I think is um, extremely important. I'm just gonna do a quick segue because I've just come back from uh, uh, Zambia. And in Zambia we visited a village and the village was, um, had m mud huts, circles of mud huts, and in a circle made of mud and wood were mud huts with thatched roof and mud floor, no windows, and a family might have four or five of those houses in their circle. And we were led around by a villager, 
And uh, it was, we saw children coming uh, towards us, a lot of them, with sticks. And the woman said, the children have to work here. And we said, well, do they go to school? Yes, they go to school, but they have to work. They, one of their jobs is to gather the sticks for the firewood, start fires. And then we went on and we, um, we, she told us that the whole place was run by a chief. And uh, that's hereditary and that this village was big, so they had sub-chiefs. And uh, before we got to that, she told me, I said, what happens if somebody's sick or doesn't, isn't able to earn any money or have any food? She said, well, we help them, of course. And then, after she told me about the chiefs, I said, what do you do if you get a bad chief? <laughs> and she looked at me without missing a beat, and she said, we poison him. <laughs> So my point is, <laughs> the teenagers feel responsible and part of the community. They have j clearly defined jobs. The parents know when to set limits, and they're not afraid to say, I'm the parent, you're the kid. And they have figured out a solution to a bad chief. <laughs> it's important to, for us to point out what immigrants bring even now, even when they're poor or don't know the language or, or don't know the customs, they bring a lot and we need to lift that up. Other questions? Yes. If you wait for the mic, that would be great. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, I'm Hi. Shana, also to Echo Grace, big fan. Um, Hi, I'm curious, you spoke a lot about reactions nationally uh, about starting the Tenement Museum. I'm curious about what was the community reaction towards starting the Tenement Museum? Well, Sam, is Sam still around? Oh yeah. Said to me one day, you know, I can't figure it out why all these people are so interested in this rundown building. Uh, that was one reaction. Another reaction, from the merchants was that we got all these people coming, but they didn't get them. And we tried to uh, address that with a variety of ways. We, we tried to uh, uh, put ha Pamela Keach, our wonderful curator, curated all their windows so they looked like they were part of the museum. And we tried to have a program where you'd go in and try to find out about their immigrant history. But the fact was, at the time, most of the stores weren't stores that people actually wanted to go into. And we couldn't do anything about that. Um, people were no longer uh, willing to go into a store where the merchandise wasn't displayed. And if you were a woman, go in looking, say, for the lingerie and have the guy look at you and say, 36C. <laughs> I mean, that's the Lower East Side at this time, and they just they, they'd already shopped at Bloomingdale's, so it was a problem. The, the stores were going out. And uh, other people said that um, they felt we, our presence would gentrify the area. And my answer was, what's gentrifying the area is the lack of, of housing stock in New York. And now, for the first time, these uh, landlords are seeing that they could make something of them and make money on them. And we weren't encouraging the landlords, but they were doing that themselves. So uh, that was an argument. Um, we had, as you know, a terrible problem when, we, when the state of New York decided to condemn the building next door to us. And it, it came about because we were told by our architects that the building was in, uh, leaning against ours and would severely damage ours. And we told that to the state, and they said, since, the, since it's empty, we'll, we'll go ahead and condemn it and pay the owners the uh, market price. Well, that didn't work at all. So they, the owners um, got, made it appear that many, many immigrants lived in the building, which they didn't, and uh, we just lost the public opinion uh, thing on that. So that was that. 
Um, but there were other people who cheered us on, you know, and some, some became board members. The Business Improvement District was not very progressive, so it had questions about the tenement, but mainly back to feeling that it um, was uh, not, not giving the merchants our visitors. So again, it was hard to do anything about it. The schools liked us very much. The, uh, some of the churches liked us very much. We had good relationships with the Catholic Church and with St. Augustine's, the Episcopal Church. And um, we tried our best. We had field trips uh, as a regular part of our staff meetings to go meet the community people and the organizations, and we made a lot of friends in that. Um, so it was, it was yes and no. I think that's really what it was. Thank you. Looking towards the back to see if there's any questions back there. If, uh, Chelsea, if you don't mind doing a, a sprint to the upper right-hand corner. Let's go, Pod Chelsea, yes. Clearly she's been working out. Yeah. Ruth, I was wondering if you could talk about your recent project, The New Lebanon. Ooh. Well, I had, you know, I, I, I try to take what's there. In New York, I took the tenement. And in, in uh, upstate New York, I live in a very rural community. And as I went into the community to get to know it, I learned that people did amazing things and I thought that I could bring, if I could get them interested in teaching what they did, I could interest um, tourists in coming to learn from them. And there the farmers and the people who did heritage cattle or made jam or slab pie or, or uh, knew how to track animals or hunted said, who'd be interested in this? And anyway, they're gonna, think we're country bumpkins and they're going to ask questions that are embarrassing and they're going to see how we live and it's not like their views of a picket fence in the farm. And I said, I think that was true. And so I, cre I established a, an opportunity for, to do just that. Um, at its peak, 70 different people in town were showing what they knew how to do to visitors. Um, but I had to move to Denver. So at the third year, I realized I couldn't run it. I hadn't, uh, it wasn't stable enough to exist without me because there wasn't a budget enough. So I gave all of the people who'd been paid to do the uh, wonderful demonstrations uh, to the Shaker Museum who needed programming. And so now if you go see someone training horses to, training uh, dogs to herd sheep, you see it at the at the Quake Shaker Museum and you see how they did it then and how they did it now. Or if you go and find out how jam is made, it's with a shaker recipe and so on and so forth. But it created income in this very poor town, so poor it doesn't have a grocery store. And uh, it, it got a lot of attention. And uh, then I created um, a driving tour which tells the story of its early history and uh, that's, uh, that's now in the hands of the Shaker Museum it's who's advertising it because it brings people into town. It's a multimedia driving tour of this early history. And it's a, the history is of the first evangelicals who were extremely progressive. Yeah. Maybe one last question. Go over here, please. I'm going to piggyback off that because we're uh, here from the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, oh, which you wonderful. also formed. <laughs> and so many of you may not know, but you, you founded what is now a global network of um, 255 members in 65 countries, all historic sites and museums using the past to um, address human rights issues today. So would you mind saying a few, few words about I what would love that? to. <laughs> the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience was I, I got this idea when the umpteenth foundation said no. And I went to see the then president of the Ford Foundation and I told her I wasn't coming for money, I was coming for advice, that I wasn't getting through to these foundations. And she said, what you're doing is so novel they can't put it in any category. And so they're just turning you down. 
you need to demonstrate that you are the wave of the future, <laughs> this idea. So I wrote over 100 national uh, historic, historic sites around the world asking if they saw history as I did, which was a conversation starter for social change. And only eight replied. They were the Slave House in Senegal, the Gulag Museum in Russia, the Liberation War Museum in Bangladesh, the Alms House in England, Mansonar. And uh, then, this was such a striking uh, eight that I went to the Rockefeller Foundation and said, could you fund us to go to Bellagio, Italy, for a week? And I knew that no one, no one would say no if I could invite them to Bellagio. <laughs> and the, the names of these museums uh, were so shocking that Rockefeller said yes. And then Liz Sevchenko and I went to Bellagio and we had this plan that we were going to come out with an international coalition. The people who were coming had a different plan. They were going to Bellagio <laughs> and they were going to learn about other museums and it would be really, really fun. So we got there and we had days of every, each person had to tell everything about their museum. And our question was, how do you use the slave house in Senegal to talk about slavery today? How do you use the alms house in England to talk about poverty today? And we pushed and pushed and then everybody got on board and all kinds of ideas came out and it was very exciting. And at the end of the week, we pledged that we were a coalition and that uh, democratic values and uh, were going to be at the core of what we did and talking, getting people to talk about these contemporary issues based on the history of our site. And it was a tremendous moment. We all knew we were breaking new ground internationally. And, uh, and it was because the Tenement Museum had pioneered on it, in it. So, but we too needed to be improved. And we went back and, and began to do that too. So the International Coalition is working its tail off so effectively. And I'm, I'm about to see Liz this summer. So I'm so looking forward to that. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, Ruth, as I expected, this was both a pleasure and an honor. Um, you're magnificent. There's no other word for it. Um, I believe very much that you've given us so much that we should give you something, or more accurately, we should give you something back. Um, on my first day on the job, July 10th, 2017, I sat down at my desk and I went to staple something. And um, I picked up my stapler on my new desk in my brand new shiny job, and I discovered that it had a piece of tape on it that said, Ruth's Stapler. <laughs> So Ruth, I'm going to give you your stapler back um, and to tell you that you are welcome to come and staple anything in my office at any time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ruth Abrams. Kissing someone